and thank you all very much for joining us this Friday afternoon. Um, this is now the fourth in our series of Neutropenia Educational Series. We previously held uh, topic uh, conversations on tweens and teens, um, school-aged children, and infants, toddlers, and preschoolers, and really just to kind of continue our age-based focused discussions. Today we'll be talking about adults with neutropenia. And alongside our, uh, our team here at BSF, we are joined by our august panelists, um, whom uh, I hope we can, uh, I'll call upon them and ask if they might briefly introduce themselves and just touch upon the topics that they'll talk about. Um, next slide, please. The first person will be Dr. Eric Scott. Thanks, Eric. So as many of you may know from previous calls, I'm a pediatric psychologist working within uh, CS Mott Children's Hospital, which is located in Ann Arbor, affiliated with the University of Michigan. And my specialty areas are really helping uh, individuals with chronic illness and disease develop coping strategies. And I often do uh, a good deal of screening for common uh, psychological and emotional health concerns particularly depression and anxiety. Uh, and also we'll be talking a little bit about or answering, happy to answer any questions about resilience. Uh, indeed, John, go blue. Uh, thank you for that. And uh, I'm happy to answer questions about uh, other topics that, that may be brought up during the discussion today. So thank you very much. Thank you, Eric. Uh, and next up, uh, Jenner, Jennifer Blaze. Hi, my name is Jennifer Blaze. I'm a fellow physician um, at also at Mott Children's Hospital in Ann Arbor, associated with the University of Michigan. Um, I work closely with Dr. Wachowicz, who will be joining us um, intermittently throughout this call. She's in the middle of clinic. Um, but I, as a um, pediatric hematologist, I see a lot of patients with neutropenia, and I'll be discussing um, care management strategies and um, any questions you guys have about kind of treatment and um, workup for neutropenia. Thank you. And of course, uh, the next one is Heidi Rothschild. Hi, my name is Heidi Rothschild. I have neutropenia. I have idiopathic chronic severe neutropenia. Uh, I was diagnosed in 2001, so I've had it for about 21 years now and managing it fairly well on Nuprogen. Um, it's hard to get diagnosed, but, uh, you know, once diagnosed, um, it was basically, um, much better and, uh, the disease was controlled pretty well. I'm an avid traveler, uh, even though I know a lot of people don't travel, but I believe you have to still lead your life with the passions that you have and, uh, weigh the risk and, and the benefits. And uh, if anyone has questions later, I'd be with them. Thank you. Wonderful. And, and in fact, you know, Heidi, you you kind of helped set off the the conversation there. And and really, can you please just tell us about your your story and your experience and your journey so far? Well, as I said, I got diagnosed about 21 years ago. Uh, at first, uh, it was very hard to diagnose. They didn't know what I, I had seen my white cells going down. And I had had my blood done because I was a hospital administrator. So I had my uh, my blood done and kind of was like watching it. But I felt great. So no problem. But then a few years later, the cells kept going down and I didn't feel so good anymore. And I was getting a lot of infections. I so was having constant stomach pain, bleeding gums, periodontal disease. Um, I get infections in my hands and, and, and then I realized that something was really wrong. And again, they still couldn't diagnose. Um, they said I had aplastic anemia and I was adamant I didn't have it, even though I really didn't know. And it just sounded like that was too much to deal with. And then I, luckily I was in the military, I was in the air force and I moved to Washington state and there I got a consult to see Dr. Dale. And Dr. Dale, once he did all my blood work and looked at my past blood work, said, I've got good news and bad news. And the good news is you have idiopathic chronic neutropenia. And the bad news is you have idiopathic chronic neutropenia. And uh, from there, I got treated and, um, and found out more about the disease. Um, 
through going to meetings. Um, and, and it was just so helpful to meet other people who had the disease and talk about their journey and listen to what they had to say and what worked for them and what didn't work for them. So that was amazingly helpful. So I'm so glad that these sessions are happening because I think they're so important. Thank you. And, you know, you, you mentioned about um, speaking with others and, and kind of helping you na navigate this process. So, you know, can you share examples of how you have not allowed this diagnosis to confine you? Like how, like how have you kind of... Uh, I, I've always been an avid traveler. I, mm -hmm. I love to travel the world and I go to third world countries. And I was told when I got diagnosed that this is going to end your travel and you can't travel anymore. And I thought to myself, they're like, it's too dangerous if you get sick. And I'm like, well, let me pick up my travel schedule in case I get sicker, because I didn't know a lot about the disease. Let me travel more now in case it gets worse later. And so I picked up my travel schedule. Um, I always traveled with antibiotics for respiratory, for skin infection and things like that, um, which worked really well until I hit China and got really sick in China and had 105 temperature and almost died, but I did get IV antibiotics there and that saved me. And I got gun shy for a year of traveling and then I started right back up again and I've continued it. So I always say that you gotta find the balance between the risk, what risk you're willing to take and how much you still wanna live your life. And when I was diagnosed, I remember my mother, she was like, oh my God, this is horrible. And, and I said, you know what? It's, it's not. It's treatable. I can deal with this. Um, I just have to manage it. And I'm not going to be a patient. I'm going to be a survivor. I'm going to do my life, lead my life with an illness. But I am illness will not define me. And that's how I'd love my life. And I just came back from Tunisia. Um, about five days ago, I was in Greece the month before, and I was in Africa the month before that. So I continue my travels. Wow. I, <laughs> <laughs> I, I thought I'd have a question about any one of those locations, but there's so many, I've, I've, I've lost track of all of you listed. <laughs> um, so yeah, like, how do you, how do you manage these, your personal expectations on like, on a good day, on a bad day? Like, how do you deal with it on, on, on such a regular basis? Like, I mean, like? I, I suffer from chronic fatigue. I also have fibromyalgia, which makes my fatigue even worse. And some days are bad and some days are good. And part of it is um, I used to be really hard on myself because I was a go-getter. I mean, I, I had years that I worked two jobs. I, you know, always was going to school, even when I didn't have to go to school anymore, because I already had my degrees, I'd still take courses. I was always trying to better myself. And then this disease happened. And I didn't like that. I felt like I was getting lazy because I was tired and I, I wasn't giving myself a break. I was kind of criticizing myself all the time because you're not doing what you used to. Why don't you have the energy? Why aren't you? And I had to learn to be my own best friend. And realized that I had some limitations, even though I didn't like it. Um, but I did have limitations and I needed to be nice to myself like I would be to somebody else. And I needed to be understanding like I'd be to somebody else. And I needed to take a step back. And on the days that I, the exhaustion was just so bad, just take a nap. I mean, take a nap. It's not the worst thing in the world. It, it doesn't matter. I'm not doing something 24-7. Um, so I had to change my expectations of myself and in some places. Yeah. Um, I, so I, I would like to flag that if anyone in the room has any questions, please uh, feel free to put them into the chat window. And I'm reminded of this because Rosemary very kindly put one into the chat window. Um, so to kind of go back to just kind of the practical management of this, you know, how have you ever run into trouble in your travels? And if so, how did you manage it? So what are the ways that you prepared? And then what are the ways that you kind of dealt with it? Well, as I, I say, I always, I travel with a pharmacy. Um, I, I usually three different kinds of antibiotics, usually a Z-Pak, Cipro, uh, Moxicillin, or, um, or, you know, things like that. But as I said, in China, it got out of hand. Um, I, 
thought I boiled water and I didn't boil it enough. So I was gravely ill. I, I spent six hours with freezing and, and sweating and throwing up and diarrhea. And I was taking my antibiotics, but I kept throwing them up. And I realized it was out of my control. Um, this is one time it got out of my control. And so I call, I was on the Yangtze River. And so I called the front desk and I'm like, you guys have a doctor? And they said, yes. I said, I need one like right now. And uh, they sent the doctor to my room and I asked her like if she had IV Cipro. I'm like, you know, or what she had. And they didn't have fluids. They had a 50 mil bottle of fluids. That's it. Because I said, look, I'm dehydrated. I need a liter. No, we don't have that. Um, so they did give me, she had, she called, told me later that I had told her I was neutropenic and it scared her. And she called the hospital in, I don't know, Beijing or Shanghai to say, what do we do? Do we have to airlift her? What do we do? And uh, they ended up giving me IV antibiotics. Um, and little by little, um, it worked and I started feeling better and I got it under control. But it was really kind of funny because the two doctors that came pulled down the other bunk in my room and slept head to toe on that bunk the rest of the night. They were not leaving me huh. and they were not going to lose a patient. So that was my worst experience ever. Um, other than that, normally it's small things. I mean, I come back with respiratory issues. I come, I get traveler's diarrhea. I get things. I mean, and I watch the food, but I watch my food intake very carefully like I went to Turkey and some of the places we went to eat, um, I just wasn't sure about. So I, I was like, oh, I'm fascinated with kitchens. Can I go see your kitchen, please? I love kitchens. I love to cook. So they'd show me their kitchen and then I'd be like not eating there. So I'd have a beer and eat bread. I mean, so, you know, I, I'm sensible too when I travel. If the place doesn't look right, then you know what, bread and a beer or bread and a Coke, you're not going to get sick. So sometimes you just don't eat the other stuff. So you've got to be a little bit wise and a little bit savvy mm -hmm. um, when you travel. And, um, and when, when you travel, how do you manage medical insurance issues? Um, well, I usually do take out the medical insurance. Um, when I travel, I didn't used to, but now that I've gotten a little older, I have, um, I've never had to use it. Um, normally if I end up seeing a doctor because it's out of this country, <laughs> it's usually pretty cheap. So, uh, I can afford it out of pocket. <laughs> Sorry, I'm not slamming doctors or anything. It's just our medical system. I'm slamming, mm -hmm. but, um, yeah, I mean, so like, you know, I was in uh, carousel and got really sick, got an ear infection. And, you know, saw the doctor and he gave me some steroids and some meds and stuff. And uh, so, yeah, I mean, I do get things, but normally either my three different kinds of antibiotics can handle it or I do have to see a doctor and get, mm -hmm. you know, get something that I don't have. Um, but I mean, I've been to 85 countries and, you know, I've had very little. Um, I've not had a lot of major issues in all those different countries. Okay. Um, <clears throat> you had mentioned earlier that you managed, um, that, that you responded fairly well to Nubigen. Yes. Um, I do have another question from Jim Rister asking, is bone pain a struggle for you, Heidi? And if so, have you found anything out of, out of the norm that helps? I, uh, the first time they gave me Nubigen, the bone pain was excruciating, but I got a lot of it. And of course it was through the forehead, especially like a headache, like I've never felt before. And I get migraines, so it was really bad. And, uh, but after that, once we titrated it and got a good dose, I, I take the lowest dose possible. Um, and I went from every day to every other day because I try to see the smallest amount I can take and remain healthy. Um, so that's kind of what I've done. And since I've done that, I've not had bone pain. So I don't have, I don't experience that. Thank you. And, and um, not, you know, I thank you very much, uh, first of all, for Kelly and, and Jenny for joining us. Kelly, thank you for calling in, even though while you're, you have clinic. Um, may, may I ask, uh, you know, uh, where's some, what, what, what would you add as a medical provider to, to what Heidi has mentioned in terms of how to manage use of Nupigen or just how to manage 
like trying to break out of your bubble as you're living with this disease? Yeah, um, I think what Heidi was saying, the best thing was like being prepared, like she's talking about, like, and it is a risk to be in another country because you don't know what the medical care is there. But knowing like if you're going somewhere, knowing where is the hospital that you're going to go to, like, how are you going to contact a doctor? Like, if you have that information ahead of time, how are you going to pay for the doctor? Um, as she was talking about, um, if you do get like specific types of infections over and over and you know, like what antibiotics work for them and you know the symptoms of them, then bringing, you know, having your doctor prescribe antibiotics and having a way to communicate maybe back with your doctor um, back in the U.S. while you're gone um, for guidance, that's also really helpful. So I think just being super prepared, um, as prepared as you can be, like obviously what you're talking about in China, like you couldn't predict that you did everything right with your you know, boiling the water, like being careful, um, you know, making sure you're, you know, looking up what infections are common in the place that you go. Like the CDC is a good website for like looking at all the infections that are endemic to different countries. So looking that up ahead of time and being pre as prepared as you can be, I think that will make you feel better as well. Um, with the Nupagen also, like I agree with like titrating the dose to, to be the minimum dose needed is definitely a way to kind of help mitigate some of the side effects of it. Um, and then also sometimes we see with bone pain, like antihistamines can be helpful for some people, like taking a daily Zyrtec, which is a pretty simple thing to do, but doesn't necessarily work for everyone. But I would just make sure your neutrophil count's not too high. Like if you're always at like 7,000 for an ANC, then that's probably why you have, you know, so much pain. So titrating and it can change over time. Like it's probably not the same dose throughout your whole life. Like that can be different um, as you get older or things change. Thank you. And and may I ask? Thanks. So. Oh, I, or Kelly, uh, Kelly too. I... Yeah, no, I mean, Jenny encapsulated most. I was going to say the only thing I was going to add is that for some of our patients with chronic neutropenia or other immune system problems who are traveling to a country that doesn't primarily speak English, we mm -hmm. have created a travel letter. Um, I write it in English and then we have it translated into Spanish um, or, you know, whatever the language is, because some of our patients have experienced some language difficulties in expressing their rare disease. Like it's already hard enough when you go to an uh, emergency department in the U.S. that you're not used to, to kind of explain what neutropenia is and what you need and your risks. Um, but if it's got a language barrier on top of it, that kind of causes some problems. So sometimes we send a travel letter. It's usually very simple. Patient has neutropenia, neutrophils do this. If the patient is in medical crisis, please consider X, Y, Z. Um, you can reach our clinic and like the phone number with the international codes on it just to try to ease the communication barrier. Wonderful, thank you. And, and while, while I have you both on the line, may I ask, could you talk about the types of GCSF that are available, including biosimilars? Um, I might let Dr. Walker talk about that. There's a lot of new biosimilars that keep coming out. We think of Nupagen as the brand um, of filgrastim that is most common, and as well as Granex and Zarya, and there's a lot of new ones. Um, so maybe Dr. Walker wants to talk more. And then I know Shelly was saying that I think in the spring, is that right, Shelly? You guys are going to have a whole talk all on biosimilars. Um, which might be yes, we are. Thanks to Dr. Walker, that we're going to we. we recruited a, a pharmacist to come and talk with us. So thanks for the plug. <laughs> yeah, that'll be a good one for everyone to listen to. So in general, the United States is way behind the biosimilar game, particularly for GCSF. Biosimilars didn't come onto the market until 2015-ish, and then two or three came. But in Europe or in many countries outside the United States, biosimilars for Nupagen or Filgastrum have been pretty well utilized. They're mostly insurance driven. We feel like they work extremely similar to one another. This, of course, was their purpose in being biosimilars, although they've not been studied intensely in patients with rare disease, whether that be chronic neutropenia or another indication that they're used for because they mostly were designed for malignancy rescue. But we feel like they're pretty similar. We have run into a couple problems that maybe doesn't affect this group quite as much because it's an adult group, but some of the biosimilars are either twice or half as concentrated as Nupagen. Um, and so that has led to a lot of dosing errors for whenever people are inpatient and they get started on a drug, but then their insurance makes them switch to a different biosimilar. 
because most patients are used to drawing up a certain volume not necessarily doing the math about the concentration. So we have had folks have a little difficulty with that. And then the packaging for one or two of the biosimilars in the United States, and I'm not sure if this is true in Europe, but I suspect um, it may be. Some of the packaging is made for adults only or for a moderate dose of GCSF only because (laughs) the way that they have the syringe and the needle, like if you have to draw up less than 0.3, um, or 30 on your syringe, you can't see the markers. The like safety needle mechanism is actually obscuring the last part of the syringe. So we have had to come up with sort of creative workarounds because insurance doesn't seem to register like what a problem that is. Um, but those are just two practical things from a drug level. Um, it'll be interesting to hear the pharmacist perspective, but we treat them relatively equally. Thank you. Um, we also have another question from Lisa. Lisa. Uh, what are some issues that may arise for neutropenia patients who may need surgery? And what are some issues? Yes, that's the question. Yeah, I mean, your neutrophils are so important in helping like your tissue heal. So um, any neutropenia, you know, around surgery, it can be can be challenging. So if it's an elective surgery, really making sure that your neutrophils are in a good place, you know, before you have surgery, obviously emergent surgeries, there's only so much you can do. Um, The other thing is depending upon the type of surgery, there might be increased risk of infection. Like if it's an intra-abdominal surgery, then there's going to be a lot of risk of infection um, during that. So needing to be on prophylactic antibiotics um, during that time. So you might need to be monitored longer in the hospital. You might need um, different doses of GCSF, or if you're not on GCSF daily, going on GCSF around the time of surgery. Um, but definitely wound healing is is inhibit is um, worsened. So Can I that's just, just something to take into account. Yes, Heidi. Follow on on that. I, I've had with my Nuprogen, I have had many many surgeries. I've had <laughs> two shoulder repairs. I've had four back surgeries. I've had um hyster- total hysterectomy i mean i've had uh, a lot and uh, plus can- uh, skin cancer twice so um but i have to say what i usually do just personally is i up my neuprogen count before i go to surgery and mm-hmm. i keep it i keep it up for maybe 4 days or so and obviously before they used when when it was not major surgery they didn't when they didn't give antibiotics ahead of time which they seem to do now all the time i would always tell the doctor i need iv antibiotics with my surgery and then i would do, i would take care of my neuprogen levels so honestly with that through all the different surgeries i've had knock on wood i've never never gotten an infection or gotten sick so um, that's just how I've dealt with it in the past. No, it's wonderful. Yeah, and, and, and Heidi, we do recommend, sorry, Eric, we do sure. actually recommend for planned surgeries, like Dr. Blaze was <laughs> suggesting, a pre-surgical plan, which we usually, this is probably practice dependent, but usually, you know, we're trying to aim for that 1,000 to 3,000 sweet spot in your neutrophil count, usually for surgery, depending on where it's at, if it's intra-abdominal, if it is in the mouth, or if there's sort of difficulty with wound healing that's higher than average, we usually try to push the neutrophil count and actually have proof in hand that it is closer to like 3,000 to 5,000 just to really optimize that. But it sounds like you were kind of self doing the same thing, but even in, in our medical view, we do it. That's great. <laughs> Thanks. And, and thank you also, Amy, for sharing um, your comment that, you know, it, it's, it sounds like a very practical approach that, um, that, that affected individuals have really undertaken on their own. Um, so, Heidi, you know, we're, we're, we're a little bit spoiled in that we have Jenny and, and, and Kelly just kind of dropping excellent knowledge for us. But, you know, can you tell us a little bit about your, your journey in, in finding that right doctor? Like, how did you serve as your own best advocate in trying to manage your care? Well, again, I was in the military and I was stationed over in Europe. And uh, at first I was near Lonsdu, which was a big hospital. But then I moved to a small little town called Geilenkirchen which, um, you know, we just had, uh, you know, your, your, um, you know, no specialties there. And, um, even though when I take the trip and go see an oncologist at lawn stool is again, they, they didn't know what it was. They just couldn't diagnose me. And they kept coming back with a plastic anemia every single time. And I just, in my gut, didn't feel like that was what it was, but 
I, I had no answers. I had no knowledge. Um, and so it wasn't until, um, you know, th that I moved to Washington State and saw Dr. Dale that I got a, a diagnosis. But after that, you know, as I moved on in the military, again, you, start, you know, you, you get what you get when you're in the military. <laughs> and um, I found some doctors to be very willing to learn if they don't know, like I would print out um, the articles, the research articles from the severe neutropenia registry. I would bring them in the research articles. I'm like, here, could you read this? This is important. You, can, you don't know how to treat my disease without this knowledge. Some would thank me and actually read it because the next time I come in, I'd ask them questions to see if they really read it. And, um, and some, oh, sorry, I've got busy. I didn't, don't have time. And the ones who didn't have time, then I'm like, I need to change my doctor. Uh, because you have to be your own best advocate. If the doctor isn't interested, most of the time, they're not going to know about the disease necessarily. Even a hematologist, some I found didn't know about the disease. But some of them were very willing to learn and happy to take what information I gave them or to call the severe uh, neutropenia registry to talk to Adriana or something to find out about it because they wanted to treat me right and I and they didn't want me to have to be my own doctor which I was with a lot of different uh, providers so I just say find the doctor that's willing to listen to you willing to learn about your disease um, that's my best advice for that thank you so um to my fellow Eric uh you know, I, we, we've kind of heard Heidi's story so far and, you know, kind of how do you strike that balance? How do you serve as your own best advocate? How do you, you know, not let the fear consume you? Kind of, I think your phrase was continue to live your passions. Um, you know, as, as, as you know, how, how, do you, how do you react to this? What are the themes that you would pull out from Heidi's experience that you think would, um, are kind of relevant to our overall conversation and to those in the room today? Yeah, so first of all, Heidi, thanks so much for sharing your story. It's it's really inspiring in that you you've touched on a couple of themes that I wanted to talk about today and so you've brought them up completely, which is 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 great. Which is there's there's a couple of different waves in psychology. So for those of you that aren't familiar with with my work, I'm a pediatric psychologist and so we often think about coping strategies and we think about how do people live their best lives? And one of the areas that's really gaining traction is this field of kind of, they call it the third wave. Many of you've probably heard of mindfulness strategies along with acceptance and commitment therapy. And often what I'm helping individuals do is focus on the things that are controllable in their life. So Heidi, when you were talking about, look, there's a couple of times in my life where things were out of my control. It's like, yeah, but you've taken so much control over so many other aspects of your life that you can take control of. And in the field of acceptance work, what we often help people to focus on are values that are really important and meaningful to them. And you've highlighted a number, a number of those, right? You want independence, but you also value traveling and you're curious. And so living out the things that are most important to you and valuable to you as opposed to many times, and I think psychology hasn't always done a good job about thinking strengths related, right? It's always about, well, there's these problems and focusing on the negative. So the, the ACT and some of the mindfulness has really helped us shift to a strengths model to say, what's important and valuable to you in life and how can you then learn coping strategies? So I was really pleased to hear about like all the active problem solving, the coping, all of those things that you do to live out your values is incredible. But those are a part of my reactions. I don't know, Heidi, if you want to add anything or, or uh, if you have any thoughts. I mean, I appreciate you saying that. It's just that I've always been a really positive person and mm -hmm. I had a lot of challenges um, throughout my life, not just medical, others. And I've always chosen to that this will not define me this will not define me this will not define me things that do i see ruin people's lives and 
I've seen too many people with illnesses that live their illness. They get so involved in their own illness, they don't live their life anymore. And I just swore that was never going to be me. I mean, I like when I was, I was 100% disabled through the military. And I remember one of the nurses, oh, I feel so sorry for, I looked at her, I said, don't feel sorry for me. I said, please don't feel sorry for me. I'm fine. I said, these are things I have. It's not who I am. And that's how I look at things. I, that's how I look at life. Eric, am I able to share my screen for a, a quick visual? Oh, it still says host disabled screen sharing. I think we need to, I can't make him the co-host. Uh, Brett, could you make Eric Scott the, a co-host? And you should be able to share We've just that. divulged who has the real power in this Zoom meeting. <laughs> <laughs> so Heidi, you may resonate with this. And, you know, we use this visual a lot. And it's, you know, it's not an optical illusion. We're not going to surprise anybody, you know, which which blue circle, we use this in the context of pain, but you can fill in any of the, you know, which blue circle is largest and we're not fooling anyone, they're the same size. The idea here is we don't want a person's pain or in this case, neutropenia to really fill out an outsized percentage or proportion of their life. And so, you know, the comments and the, the things that you've shared point to how you've really pushed the circle out and said, hey, this is my life. Yes, I happen to have this, but this is who makes me who I am. And, you know, really pushing those boundaries out and saying, I want to live the fullest life that I can with what I can control is really what we're, you know, excited to hear about. And I think other people are inspired and excited to hear about how you've done that. And I think the challenge for them is to say, hey, how do I expand those horizons for myself? You know, one one other thing that I, I did is because my frustration with the chronic fatigue, which is a big frustration, um, I, I when I was getting my doctorate, I wrote so many papers on chronic fatigue, on neutropenia, on fibromyalgia, on alternative treatments. And I've gone to homeopaths, naturopaths, um, you name it. I've tried everything to see if if some of the symptoms maybe could be alleviated. Um, and I, I, I was not successful. Um, I, I mean, I, I've spent years trying to find different modes of therapies to uh, try to at least decrease the, the fatigue, which is, a, is, is big. And, um, and, and, <laughs> and finally I was told, you know, you can keep searching, but I think you're, you've ended, you know, you, you're at the end of your search. So I, I, I wasn't a, um, uh, a bystander. Um, I was always trying to search and find any way I could to um, mitigate the fatigue. But uh, I finally learned that maybe, you know, I guess I will be living with it. It took me 20 years to figure that out, though. Yeah, it sounds like another example of acceptance saying, I want to acknowledge reality, work hard to control the things that I can change, but also acknowledging that I'm going to commit myself to other endeavors in life despite having this particular symptom. Mm -hmm. Correct. Yeah. So I, I, I do want to say, Eric, um, thank you for sharing that image. Um, it, it, uh, it, it supports our phrasing of, affected individuals with Barth syndrome, as opposed to a Barth syndrome like patient, right? It's that the disease doesn't define you. So you are, you know, the disease is with you. Um, may, may I, so just to transition the conversation a little bit, I do want to uh, flag Mitch Ryan's, but, but I'll, did you have more though, Eric, before I, I unceremoniously transition? Um, sorry. I, I, I'd like to flag Mitch Ryan's question. Um, and this is going to Jenny. Uh, are there any clinical insights into risk of complications from COVID infection among patients with chronic neutropenia? How would the risk of a neutropenia patient vary relative to the general population, assuming that you're vaccinated, 
given an affected individual's heightened risk of infection complications? Yeah, that's a good question and one that, of course, we're like still learning a lot about. Um, you know, by definition, if you have neutropenia that doesn't have any other associated immune defects, which sometimes it does, you know, sometimes people with neutropenia are really part of a larger um, a immune deficit where they might have um, issues with their lymphocyte cells or their response to vaccines. But assuming you don't, um, then the primary, you know, mechanism for protecting against COVID is the lymphocyte cells, which is a different cell, which is the one that vaccines respond to. So in theory, you shouldn't necessarily be more likely to have more severe, like initial COVID. But I think the problem is whenever you get a viral infection, especially a severe one that could make you like really sick, then you're always at risk for secondary complications. So secondary bacterial pneumonia, secondary um, other bacterial infections, and that's I think where the risk with neutropenia is, but um, that's as far as like we kind of know now that there just might be risk of secondary bacterial infection. So being really cognizant of that, like if you get sick with a viral infection, seems to be getting better and then you feel sicker, like you have to realize that that could be another bacterial infection at the time. And so, and you never really know, it's hard to know if something viral or bacterial. So always still like going to see your doctor and making sure there's nothing else that antibiotics might be helpful for. But it's um, as far as, you know, some of the medications we use for um, patients with immune deficits where they get Evashield, which is like an antibody um, that protects against COVID. We don't necessarily give that to patients that just have neutropenia alone. Um, but we definitely recommend vaccination for everyone. Um, and so that you don't get that secondary infections once you're immune, you know, once you're dealing with a viral infection. Thank you. And uh, as to continue the medical thread, um, another question from Lisa. Mm -hmm. My doctor suggested that I move to find a neutropenia expert. She has mm -hmm. other doctors who are now informed and not really wanting to move. What advice would you have for a patient who needs to find a neutropenia expert? Yeah, I think that's really tough. I feel like, um, moving is such a huge life decision. And I, I don't think that usually should be necessary, especially um, in the time of, you know, virtual visits and being in information sharing. Like I know when I have patients that are rare patients where I'm not the best expert, you know, on that disease. And, and same with Dr. Walkvich will agree that when we have those really rare patients, we reach out to the experts and we get advice from them. And I feel like all those experts are very willing to help. I mean, I can't tell you how many people I've just cold emailed, um, you know, some expert on a very rare um, immune disorder and they get back to you and they have conversations with you and they're really helpful. There's lots of resources for doing that. So I, I would think you'd be able to find a provider who's at least willing to do that, to reach out to those experts um, or, Either, or going to like a specialized clinic. Some people, I, I've had patients that go to some, you know, specialized clinic once a year, once every other year um, for a visit, but they don't have to necessarily live in that location. So I guess it depends, but I feel like to move um, is, is, a, is a big, a big deal. So um, I would leave that to the patient, but I feel like if you trust your doctor and they're at least willing to um, reach out to experts when there's something about your disease that they don't understand or they're not able to manage, then I think it's okay to stay with doctors that you trust um, that live close to you. I don't think all neutropenia patients need to live in like New York or Boston. That's a little bit excessive. Thank you. Um, and uh, may, may I ask uh, another question from Amy? Um, what are the what are your thoughts about Evashield for, for COVID? Oh, yeah. So we just, there's, that's, I kind of brought it up in our past, but we actually like just since in the last couple of weeks, there's been like new data that's come out that Evishield's not effective um, against the newer variant. So we're not um, offering it anymore. I think anyone, like at, our, at least at our institution, someone that, you know, has an appointment and still wants to get it, we're giving it um, because we have it available, but it has not been shown to be effective against the new variant. So I don't know if they're planning to make you know, a new version of it that does have antibodies protective against new variants, but right now it's, it's not effective. Thank you. Um, oh, another question from Rosemary. 
Um, Heidi mentioned diarrhea and respiratory issues as a couple of her other related issues. Uh, for BART patients, these can be much larger um, part of their uh, management issues. Uh, do you have any suggestions for how the, the uh, diarrhea and respiratory issues might be managed? Maybe, Dr. Rodrick, do you want to take this? Because I don't really have it. Yeah, sorry. Thanks, Jenny. It's a, kind of a chaotic day here with the, the snow and, and the ice contributing to some chaos in clinic. But yeah, I think from the diarrhea and the respiratory infections, you know, it really depends what the source or like the root cause of your neutropenia is. Uh, there are some patients who, besides just having neutrophil problems, also have deficits or defects in other aspects of the immune system, most often either in B cells or what we call the humoral immune system. And that can really impact your lung susceptibility to infection and actually your gut. Your gut, we don't think about this very often, but it's a pretty big immune organ. It has a lot, a lot of lymphocytes, which are one of the other type of white blood cells besides neutrophils. So if you're having sort of a disproportionate amount of infections or frequent infections or unusual infections or things like difficulty keeping weight on or chronic diarrhea, that is something you want to bring up and sort of have your provider just think about whether you weren't screening for other immune problems. Uh, in terms of management, um, we typically would look for infection um, as a primary source if these are acute episodes. But we also would look for just sources of chronic inflammation, so like inflammatory bowel disease, for example. Um, we, as a lot of our patients with chronic neutropenia are surviving past adolescence and into young and even um, older adulthood in their sort of 40s, 50s, 60s now, we're realizing that some of the later complications that very commonly are well-defined neutropenia syndromes, there's actually a lot of that inflammation associated, chronic inflammation that sets up problems most often in the gut uh, or in the lungs. So I don't think it's a maybe as well appreciated spectrum of disease, but certainly neutrophil function is very important for maintaining immune health in both those organs. Thank you. Um, and, and this is, uh, this kind of spills over to, to Eric, Jenny, and Kelly. Um, do, 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 pediatric nutri, do pediatric neutropenia experts see adults as patients? Oh, I feel like that's a big sometimes. So I know Dr. Malkovich does, um, but uh, that really depends on um, the institution. I know with when we've seen a patient in pediatrics, we, you know, you'll at least follow them through like mid 20s. Um, and then it really depends on the center if they have a counterpart in the adult um, sphere that can help transition them. And I think that's a big thing of like making sure the transition goes smoothly. So starting to, you know, if you have like a um, adolescent patients starting to ask early about the plan for transitioning and having like some overlap in visits for a little bit to make sure both providers are on the same page. Um, but some, some places won't have uh, some centers, especially big academic centers, they might allow you to see the pediatric um, provider if they're the more expert in neutropenia, just because we see a lot of neutropenia in the younger children. Um, but it really depends. And the one thing you have to be aware of, though, when you see a pediatric provider in the outpatient sphere, um, if you have to be admitted or go to an emergency room, then it's going to be like an adult emergency room or an adult um, hospital. So there's going to have to be coordination um, with that. So you still have to have, you know, an adult provider, like a, obviously adult general um, doctor, but realizing that it's, there's going to be a little bit of coordination. So I think it just depends. Um, yeah, I think those of us, um, no, that was a very eloquent answer, Jenny, and I think that's a very practical answer, but I think, I think somebody just put in there, it's really hard to find an adult provider. Um, mm -hmm. That is true. There are not enough adult hematologists, you know, that study rare blood disease. And then I think a lot of the chronic neutropenia population hasn't quite aged enough, kind of like a lot of the congenital heart patients didn't quite age enough to get expertise fully built up in the adult side. So here in our clinic, we do see almost all the adults with chronic neutropenia. For some of them, we followed for decades. And so we just have a clear plan. As a pediatrician, we take care of the neutropenia and the neutropenia concerns, but we actually partner really closely with their primary care physician, which since Michigan is a fairly spread out state, meaning that there are a lot of rural areas. You have to drive 
pretty far. That actually has been a good practice for us because it allows their primary doctor to know what's happening. They have sort of direct access to us, but it also, particularly in COVID, allowed us to provide care in place, meaning that they could get care locally um, and really facilitated that. For patients with neutropenia that need annual bone marrows for malignancy surveillance or for bone marrow failure or anything along that line that requires a procedure that touches on some of the things Dr. Blaze mentioned, where if you need sedation, you need to get admitted, then you need an adult friend in most instances. And so we do partner with our adult team colleagues who have been very gracious um, to offer the coordination, but it does just require a little bit. And I think those of us who are peds that do this day in and day out, we get lots of emails. I think I heard um, Jenny, you mentioned earlier, where I was kind of like half, half in a room trying to get back that it's like fine to stay. Like if you don't have an Uber expert right in your back door, that's okay. We're only an email away and we're always happy to help. If, if you'd like us to share your email, Kelly, we can. <laughs> that's <laughs> totally fine. <laughs> and and, and so, so Eric and, and, and Gillian, I see you, 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 you've you uh, turned on your camera. Like, right, would you like to share a little bit about your, your experience in that pediatric to adult transition? Yeah, so we run a lifetime service, um, which means that actually because our clinicians are all based in the children's hospital, they are all paediatric clinicians. So being that the metabolic specialist, the hematologist and the cardiologist. However, we um, will continue to go on and see them throughout their lifetime. Now, I think our oldest patient at the moment is only 32, so slightly younger than the U.S., but we've followed them up through the service over the years. So we actually know them extremely well. Um, we work with their local, obviously, general practitioner. Plus, we ask that they all have a local hematologist as well, be that adult or pediatric. And then we'll liaise very closely with them. Um, we also have perhaps you have something similar in the US, but we have a hospital management plan so that the individual carries either a paper or an electronic copy round with them and it's updated annually. Um, it lists all the medications and then it lists the key features of Barth syndrome, um, how to contact the team and what things you need to be doing. So if you have cardiac concerns, you need an echo. If they come in with um, signs of infection, these are the bloods that you need to be doing. These are the antibiotics that we would suggest that you start them on. So really, it's kind of a, a two page document that it, it is a how to guide, um, because invariably they're going to come in on a weekend in the middle of the evening when nobody knows what to do and they can't get hold of one of us from the team. Um, and yeah, I mean, we run an open door policy. So although the phone gets switched off at 5 p.m., our emails were always on and, and, you know, we do kind of keep an eye on things. If anybody's hospitalized, like one of our patients today, um, I have the capacity as well, depending on where they are in the country, I'll travel and visit with them so that I can speak and educate with the, the local team as well. Um, so we're very lucky to have that multidisciplinary approach here in the UK. Thank you. And, and just as context, uh, uh, Gillian is with the Bar Syndrome Service at uh, NHS Bristol in the UK. <clears throat> so, uh, Eric, um, did, did, did you have, would you like to comment on your kind of experience of the transition pathway and, um, you know, how you might help with, how you might use it to help you with resilience? Yeah, absolutely. Thanks. So, I don't typically see adults so that they did do transition into, you know, as they transition into adulthood, we think about it as a transition skill. So thinking about the skill of being able to assertively communicate your needs. And so like Gillian was describing, being able to communicate to providers that you may not know, how do you advocate for yourself and how do you uh, do that in an effective way? And so we often role play as uh, patients are transitioning to adulthood how do you communicate? What kind of script do you want to memorize and commit to memory? And what are the key features of your care that you need to be able to communicate to people that may not know much about uh, any of the symptoms that you have or the illnesses? And so treating, as a, treating it as a skill helps us you know, practice and, and help people get better at it. So raising their competence and therefore confidence to be able to do that effectively is a really important thing to help people and to empower them for their care. And so, again, we treat it as a, a coping strategy, but as a skill and as an opportunity to learn and, and to grow. 
Thank you. Well, I just wonder what say one thing what um, Jillian was like mentioning about having the document. I feel like nowadays too, a really good thing is putting stuff in like your phone's medical ID. I don't know how many people actually put stuff in that, but it's really helpful. Um, and I've helped my patients, like some of my teenagers who are going off to college. And I'm like, what if you something happens to you and you go to the emergency room and you don't have your mom with you to explain this um, to the people? So I've helped them like fill out their medical ID. There's like a place for notes for all your medications and it can be really helpful, especially if you feel overwhelmed, you know, in a situation you don't know how to explain it best if you have it written down. Um, that can be helpful. And everyone always has their phone with them. So versus like, you know, paper that you might not have with you. Thank you. Um, so it, it's a, it sounds like we have a lot of resources that we can drop on. I think um, we'll, we'll try to pull together that, uh, I think that travel letter that was mentioned earlier would be awesome um, in terms of, you know, the, the translations. And I think uh, Jenny's commentary is also very timely. Um, you know, in, in previous sessions, we've talked about the importance for a young neutropenia patient to see a therapist. And, and I think what, what Eric and Mashina Mahalik, you're kind of trying to teach those skills younger so that you can, you're able to draw upon them in your older, as, as an adult. Um, so, I, you know, Eric, um, may I ask, what symptoms of anxiety and fear might a parent with chronic neutropenia observe in their children, and how might they help navigate that to poise them for success in adulthood? Yeah, th thanks for the question. It's a good one. I think, you know, starting with the basics of the anxiety symptoms that you're likely to see for uh, individuals that have chronic illnesses, there may be the worry that the child has about, am I going to inherit this, this illness as well? Am I going to start displaying or showing the symptoms? And so, you know, good education about what the disease is and how it may impact that person uh, if they do have it is a, an important place to start. Other aspects of anxiety, you know, the constant asking of reassurance, some separation worries, especially in younger kids, those are symptoms to look for, things to look for. Uh, other aspects of anxiety are, you know, kind of fearful of things going badly. And like Heidi was describing, right, it's, I have this and it's an important aspect to recognize that this is part of who I am, but then not constantly fearing that. And so, dealing with those fears are effectively treated through something called cognitive behavioral therapy. So if you're noticing a lot of anxiety symptoms, constant reassurance questions, fear and um, trepidation about leaving home or you know, trepidation about a lot of things, cognitive behavioral therapy is found to be very effective even 10 and 15 years post-treatment. So the, the follow-up studies, especially in pediatrics, are very robust. And the, the benefit of cognitive behavioral therapy, and uh, that's basically helping people think differently. So instead of the what ifs, you know, could this turn out differently than what my fears are telling me? And thinking about alternative strategies to think differently in those settings, uh, again, in the context of anxiety, are very effective and helpful and often don't require medication. So they can be skills that can be learned. Those are it's good to share that information just because it's a positive aspect of treatment. Uh, so yeah, certainly looking for those anxieties and then seeking help uh, when necessary is super important. Thank you. Um, so as uh, as we're kind of coming up to the top of the hour, um, I do want to thank everyone for their time and their attention. And uh, we also kindly ask that, um, uh, next slide please. Uh, we, we, we will be sending out a survey uh, to, uh, for, from this session. We really very much ask that you please help fill out the survey because not only does it let us know if we're helping meet your needs, um, but also at the same time, you know, how can we better improve our process? Um, and we do have two more minutes. So we did start this conversation off with Heidi telling her story. And Heidi, you kind of you kind of set us off and, you know, we got into a medical conversation. We kind of touched upon, you know, how do you, how do we deal with this from a mental health perspective? Um, may I ask, like, what would be your parting thoughts and comments for those in the room? You'll, you'll have to uh, unmute first, though. Just unmute <laughs> it. It took me a sec. 
I, I all I can say is, I, and I know I didn't get this as a child, and I got it as an adult, so I think differently. But I've gone to a lot of the different neutropenia meetings and seen the children, and all I could say is don't treat people differently because of the disease. Yes, you have to watch out. Yes, you have to be careful. Don't make them think they're so different that they don't fit in. Keep them safe, but let them live. Let people live with the disease. And, um, and, and choice is so important um, for it not to be forced and I, I realize, like a lot of situations, it's your children and you want to protect them, but they also have a life to live. And um, I had a life to live, too. And I needed to live my life and everybody has to live their life. So that that's it's so important to remember that they're still a human being and um, and they're not their disease. Thank you. Um, thank you all for your time. Thank you for sharing your story, Heidi. Thank and you. Uh, I wish you all a very wonderful coming weekend and uh, happy Thanksgiving.